asleep when the preacher is preaching, and that's if the preacher himself falls asleep while he's preaching. That happens, things are really getting bad. Um, this title for this message, I believe, is called Bringing Forth Children of Destiny. Is that correct? For those of you that are, you know, know why you're here. All right. Bringing Forth Children of Destiny. You know, uh, when you think about children, several years ago, I remember that when we used to think about children, and, and this would not be mainly for necessarily just for Christians, but for anybody that has a, a brain in their head, any parent, that most of us want to have good kids. I don't think there's too many people that would say, I want my children to be a criminal, or my child to be a criminal. I want my kids to uh, get into gangs and, and, and to uh, roam the streets and to, um, you know, become violent and things like that. I think most people that have any brains in their head want their children to be good. Unfortunately today, good is no longer good enough. There used to be a time when uh, you could pretty much, you know, get children to be good because the environment that they found themselves in was quite different from our culture today. Today our children are being born into a very hostile environment. They're being born into the war zone and so no longer is good going to work for them. In actual fact, if you think in terms about being good, good is no longer looked upon as something that is necessarily good. There used to be a time uh, in the old movies where a hero was someone who was good. Roy Rogers, you know, or some of those old cowboys, uh, they were good. They had high principles, high morales, and they always did the right thing. But today, the heroes that you see are what we call anti-heroes. They, they are not good. And of course, the argument is we want to show you what people really are like, what life is really about. And so uh, most of the heroes that, that the kids see today are not what I would call really good role models. They, uh, they do bad. I mean, the heroes jump into bed with every woman they can see and they, you know, and they kill people and yet they're still regarded to be heroes. And of course, in the, the rock concerts and the musicians out there, you know, they're, fo they're, they're following these kind of people that are... Uh, not very good role models and not very good heroes. And unfortunately, it's also happened in the church. A lot of leaders in the church have not been good role models for the young people. A lot of the ministries have come crashing down and so on. So uh, obviously, good doesn't seem to work. Also, the other thing about I've noticed about kids, that if a kid is regarded to be good, often that child will be made fun of by the other children. Ah, you're one of those goody-goodies. Never have any fun. Mama's little pet. Just be good all the time. Little square kid. And so kids don't really want to be regarded as some good little sort of sissy boy or something. They, you know, they, they want to look, be cool and they want to be, you know, accepted. And, you know, and, and most kids will, will tell you that it's more fun to be naughty than it is to be good. I mean, good today speaks of boredom. Sit down, be good. Don't spit, don't do this, don't do that, don't pick your nose. Stand to attention, sit to attention, and listen to the preacher. And be good, and don't mess around in church, and be good, stay out of trouble. Don't mess around with those bad kids, be obedient to your parents, don't fight with your brothers and sisters, you know, don't tell lies, this, that, and the other. All these things are right and correct, but it's like a boring set of rules that kids begin to hear, and they have a hard time responding to that, and so, you know, they, they turn out sometimes to be bad rather than being good. So, obviously, what we've got to do today, folks, is to bring our children not to a place of merely being good, but to go beyond being good. Now, there's a lot of wonderful books and tapes 
out there about training your children to be obedient. And we have some awesome books on our table, like to train up a child and child training tips. Awesome. But you know, you can train your child to be obedient and to comply with all your requirements, yet they could still be spiritually dead. So obviously, you know, we want to go beyond the evangelical church. We want to go beyond that. I'm not, I'm not attacking or criticizing anybody, but we want to go beyond even the Dobson's teaching about parenting and, and children, going beyond because I believe it's great for kids to be good and obedient, but I want my children to go beyond being good, to be anointed, and to have a sense of purpose and destiny upon their lives. So it doesn't stop at being good. We have to go beyond that. And the motivation, I believe, for our children today is not to sit down and give them a set of rules of how to behave and how to be good, but to push them further to give them a sense of destiny and a sense of purpose. Every time you pray for your child when they go to bed, you should be able to, you know, as you pray over them, you should say to them, you have a destiny. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, that's a motivation. And uh, to give you a, a biblical scripture for what I'm trying to, to put across to you this afternoon, uh, you can look up the uh, scripture regarding Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, the Lord speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, that is an awesome scripture, because God was saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were inside your mother's womb, I had a plan and a purpose and a destiny for your life. Now, if that's not a good scripture coming against the whole philosophy of abortion, I don't know what is. Our modern society today says that children in the womb are just a fetus. It's part of the mother's body. It does not really have an identity. It doesn't have a personality. It doesn't have any rights. God says, uh-uh. Before you were born, I knew you. Before you were inside your mother's womb, I had a plan and a purpose and a destiny for your life. Now, if children don't understand their worth and their destiny, then they're obviously going to have a difficult time and they're going to fall for the great lie that all they are is just some kind of an animal just to eat, sleep, have sex, and, and die, and that's it. God has something bigger. We're not just an animal. And the amazing thing is that destiny with a child doesn't begin when they're 10 or when they're 12 or when they're 15. It actually begins before they are born. It's amazing that the youngest person ever to praise God was John the Baptist. John the Baptist praised God before he was born. You remember the story. Mary came after having a visitation from the angel. Gabriel came over to her cousin Elizabeth, all excited. She said, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you'll never guess what happened to me. Elizabeth said, yes, Mary, I know. As soon as I heard your voice calling me, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. John the Baptist went, praise God, right there inside his mother's tummy. So we're now seeing that that child, that infant, that infant, even before it's born, has a purpose and a destiny upon its life because its spirit responded to the Spirit of God. 
Now, his mind didn't respond to the Spirit of God. That child's mind wasn't understanding. I mean, like I've said, you know, you can't go up to a little baby with a big black Bible and say, now listen, kid, are you ready to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and repent of your sins? Because if you're not, you're going to hell. I mean, an infant will not respond to that, but an infant will respond to the Spirit of God because a baby is not just a physical shell. It's a spirit being, and it has a spirit. And the Spirit is eternal, and God is eternal. And God says, destiny and purpose. So we have to bring forth children of destiny. Of course, abortion is not just something that is a convenience in our modern society. It's something deeper than that. It's a satanic program. A satanic agenda that Satan is putting forth. In fact, he started it, you know, right there in the beginning. Moses was the first one that come, uh, come under attack of being slaughtered. Because Satan knew that out of the Hebrew nation was going to come a deliverer. And then Herod was used to try to kill baby Jesus. Because there was going to come a deliverer from, again, from the Hebrew nation. And Satan is out to kill kids. I've often said he is the kidnapper. As Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, he is the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And um, unfortunately, Satan is not some ugly monster that kids think, you know, they think of Satan with a red tail and horns and really ugly he is not Satan is very attractive and very seductive and he's out to kill and to destroy children but he doesn't go up to kids with a great sort of horrible face and say yeah you're dead me I'm gonna kill you he comes along and he uses every means through his demons and 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 the effect that he has on our society to seduce our children into the areas of drugs and sex and violence and the whole thing that's being peddled to them through MTV and the whole media and through Harry Potter and Pokemon, all this stuff, to steal our children's hearts. Once he's got their hearts, he's going to, just a matter of time before he destroys them totally and rob them of their destiny and of their purpose. So, welcome to the war zone. Welcome to the battlefield. Raising good kids to be good, it can turn out to be wimpy. That's one of the problems, and I, I, I think homeschool is great, but I sometimes think that homeschoolers end up raising wimpy kids. They're overprotective, they stay at home, they stay with mummy and daddy, and they never have much to do. They don't go on mission trips usually. Oh no. Oh, I couldn't send my child on a mission trip. And so we grow these little these little wimpy kids sometimes in our homeschool situation like little sunflowers and we don't train them up to be powerful, anointed and having a sense of destiny. And when they do go out in the world, they're going to be I mean they're going to be just eaten alive. I remember a uh, church in Atlanta, a friend of mine who has a church in Atlanta, Georgia, he said they had a whole bunch of, of, um, of homeschool kids in their church, and they decided that they were going to go out and evangelize the kids out there in one of the areas in Atlanta where the kids congregate. And there's an area there called Media Play where all the kids hang out, all the teenagers hang out. So all these homeschool kids, they, they got themselves a kind of a truck thing, and it was called, I don't know, it was... Um, some like a SWAT team or something, and they dressed up in all their little uh, uniforms, and they hit the streets, and they got to this media play. Well, this media play, there's about 300 kids there, and, I mean, there's witches and wickers there, and kids are having sex around the corners or on the cars and everything. I mean, it's wild, wild, wild. I mean, that's there. That's where they hang out. And these kids jumped out of this, uh, these little homeschool kids jumped out of the of the truck and went running up to these other kids to witness to them 
and those those witches and workers at those kids alive i mean they chewed them up and spat them out i mean they were using four letter words and the mf word and and these homeschool kids have never heard words like that before they've been so they're going oh 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 and i mean it scared the pan they, they just retreated and they realized that they'd never trained these kids to be warriors and dragon slayers and they had overprotected them to be nice good little kids of course i think most of us would like our ch children to be good and to be obedient and also to be anointed and powerful sometimes we don't always have it that way sometimes we end up having kids who are nice and obedient and are spiritually wimpy or spiritually dead or else if we do get kids you know we get kids that are feisty and 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 strong-willed but they have a call and anointed on their lives and we think oh you know i know my kids are strong-willed and anointed they have a call. i just wish they'd be a little bit more obedient nice to have it both ways but anyway i would rather have my kid feisty and strong willed and have a passion for God than have a kid that always complies with what I say and is totally wimpy and spiritually dead. Are you with me? But we can have both, I believe. But bringing forth children of destiny is something I believe that is the number one issue today because it motivates them. In other words, God doesn't want children to be good just for the sake of being good. He wants our children to be good and righteous that they may qualify to become champions, dragon slayers, warriors, and world changers. So the destiny that we have to instill into our children to let them know that they're not born to party, they're not just here to be nice little kids, but they, God has an awesome purpose and destiny upon their lives. Now, this is going against, of course, a lot of the, of the uh, culture that we find ourselves in today. For example, we'll get back to the abortion program again. Abortion today we have because people say, children are something to get rid of if they are an inconvenience yet Psalm 127 is, says children are a heritage from the Lord doesn't say they're a nuisance the fruit of the womb is not an inconvenience to be aborted but the fruit of the womb is a reward the fruit of the womb is a reward from God like arrows in the hands of a warrior so are the children of one's youth happy is the man who has his quiver full that's five for a start for they shall not be ashamed. They shall not be confounded. They shall not be ashamed. For they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, what does that all mean? Well, when Adam and Eve were created, the first thing that God said, did with Adam and Eve, once he had created them, he says, then God blessed them. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. The first thing that God ever did was not curse them, but bless them. And then God said, be fruitful and have kids. Fill the earth with children. Have this whole, whole world populated with children. Now, why did God want this whole earth to be populated with children? The reason was, I believe, that God wanted to look down from heaven and look at a little girl and say, look at that, she, just, she looks just like her papa. Look down from heaven and look at a little young boy and say, look at that, he's just like his dad. Chip off the old block. You know, most parents want their children to look like them. 
unless they're ugly, of course. But I mean, you know, he's got his father's eyes, he's got his mother's nose, and so on. We are, we know, we love to see something of the image of us in our own children. And God, when he created Adam and Eve, they were made in the image of him, and I don't understand all the ramifications to that, but there was something that God wanted to see in his creation that reflected something of his image. And the interesting thing is this, that Satan knew that his, what he had to do is he had to get Adam and Eve to sin before they had any children. Because if they had had children first and then eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil afterwards, Satan would have had a problem. Because you see, Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. But when they ate of the tree, the glory of the Lord departed. They lost that image, as it were. And instead of being connected to God, they were now living on soul power. They now became independent. They were cut off. They were no longer connected to God. They become independent angels in, agents in their own rights. And then when they had kids, their kids were no longer made in the image of God. They were made in the image of Adam. They were created in the image of Adam. When they had children, their children, it, uh, their children inherited the Adamic nature, which was the fallen nature. And Satan says, I've got it. I've got the first couple. And down through all the generations, I've... I've I've messed up, I've polluted every seed that has come from down through the generations. So every seed then that came from Adam and their, and, and their children and their children's children and children's children and so on, all through the generations we have had polluted seed and the godly seed has something which has been messed up. Except God made a provision. He made a provision. And the provision he made was not to build a bigger Adam and a stronger Adam. His solution to the problem was a baby. Produce a new seed, a righteous seed, a godly seed. And so when that new seed came through Jesus Christ and the attack was upon that seed and that new generation came through Jesus Christ and that new race that came through Jesus Christ, there was the answer to bring forth people of destiny and people of purpose. See, the people of the world have no destiny. They have no purpose. The children that don't know God have no destiny. Even the good people have no destiny. If in this life only we have hope. We are of all men most miserable. The only people that have destiny are Christians, Christ ones, anointed ones. Those are the only ones. No one else has destiny or purpose. They're living just for this world. Jesus said, you know, are you going to be like the people of the world? What should we drink? What should we wear? And then he says, no, listen, you're not like the kids of the... Your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And don't worry about all those other things. We don't live for food, drink, and sex. We live for something bigger and greater. I want to tell you ladies this morning, this afternoon, you were not born just to get married and have kids. You guys were not created just to go and get a job and make money to provide for your family. Now, those are the things we have to do because it's part of the curse, in a sense. I've said this before, you know, that when God, when God brought the, the, when the curse came upon Adam and Eve when they sinned, he said to Adam, you know, by the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. I owe, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go was never God's intention for you gentlemen. Hello? And he said to the woman, in, in childbirth you will bring, you know, you will have children in pain. And so it was never God's intention that when a woman has a child, she should be in terrible pain and discomfort. And I don't know what it's like to have a child, but I heard a lady once say, she said, if you men want to know what it's like to give birth to a baby, she says, take your top lip and pull it over the back of your head. And then you'll know what it's like. 
But that was never God's intention. And then he finally said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. You know, and he, he said to the serpent, and, and so, you know, the hostility broke out between the children of light and the children of darkness, between the children of God and the children of the devil. And so here we are now called as, as the righteous seed, the righteous generations. Generations is the genes that go through, you know, from, that come from every generation came out of Adam and Eve. And the, the, the generations are in the men. The women produce the children, but the, the seed is in the man. The generation is in the man going through generations and if it's polluted we bring forth polluted children if it's righteous we'll bring forth righteous children we can go into the curses the generational curses and so on which we don't have time to go into but those children that God said we should children are a heritage from the Lord the fruit of the womb is a reward The fruit of the womb is a reward like arrows. Arrows in the hands of a warrior. What are arrows? Weapons of warfare. What do you do with arrows? Well, the first thing you have to do with an arrow is sharpen it. You have to sharpen that arrow. Train up a child in the way he should go. It's not just going to be sharp. We have to hone those arrows. We have to sharpen those arrows. We have to train those children up with a sense of purpose and destiny, realizing how, why God has called them on planet Earth, not to, not to work at McDonald's for the rest of their life, not to hang out with their friends down the mall, but for something bigger and greater than that. Then you take those arrows and you put them in the bow and you fire them. Where? Where do you fire the arrows? They shall not be ashamed, for they shall speak with the enemies at the gate. What is the gate? The gate of the city is where the elders sat. The gate of the city was, this, was the place of authority where the people that ruled the whole city sat. Now, one of the problems we have in our society, folks, is this. We have corrupt, ungodly seed sitting in the places of authority in our country. Hello? How many of you realize that you have problems in your cities? Pensacola, I'm surely, has a problem in Pensacola, I'm sure there are there are dives and and and, and porno uh, parlors and strip clubs and gangs and drugs and is that right? Any city has it, and it's amazing that the local government and the police are frantically trying to find ways of solving the problem. It is vain for you to rise up early and sit up late and eat the bread of sorrows. And yet we have our local governments and our federal governments, they're arguing, they're debating the educational system, they rise up early, they sit up late, they think of all their agendas, we need more, pr more police, we need more prisons, we need more this, we need more, more that. But the Bible says, unless the Lord keeps the city, the local police and the government are wasting their time. The watchmen Stay awake in vain. Hello. And the biggest problem we have in our day is that they don't want God in the city. There is such a strong agenda by saying, keep God, if you're going to have God at all, make it personal. It's all right for you to have your funny little quirks. It's all right for you to have your funny little faith as long as you keep it to yourself. And we don't mind you going to your little churches and doing your religious thing as long as it stays within the four walls of the building. But don't bring it out in the marketplace. Don't bring it out in the public schools. Don't bring it out in the government. Don't bring it out in the hospitals. Don't bring it out on the media. Squash it. Shut it up. Make it a personal thing, and it will 
die. That's the UCLA's uh, agenda. UCLA, is that right? ACLU, always ACLU, ACLU, yeah. I get them, something like that, yeah. That's their agenda. That's the Satan's agenda. Destroy the godly seed. Destroy the children that have destiny and purpose on their life. And we can march around and we can sing and praise God and we can wave our banners and jump up and down. And I'm not saying that's wrong, but if, we, if that's the only thing we do, the devil doesn't care. As long as we don't affect our communities around us. We can hoot and holler in our churches and jump 20 foot up in the sky. It's not going to mean anything if we can't take out that which God has given us and affect our neighborhoods and our cities and our marketplaces and our schools and our colleges and our universities and our governments. It's not going to do a thing. It'll all just be wind and jumping and hooting and hollowing. So, take those arrows and train them, hone them, sharpen them, and then fire them from the bow. Not all our children are going to be missionaries. Not all our children are going to be preachers and evangelists and pastors. Some of them will. But some of our children will become school teachers. Some of them will become nurses and doctors. Some of them will become attorneys and lawyers. Some of them will work in the local government and in federal government. And some of them will be on the news media as anchor women and anchor men. You know what? What they will do is they will take out the ungodly and replace it with the godly so that this nation can be affected by God's people. We sang our little songs in our churches, you know, over the years. We don't want this world, we just want Jesus. And the devil says, thank you very much. I'll take your world, I'll take your cities, I'll take your communities. Folks, we're in a war. This is a spiritual war that we're in. And it's up to us to train up a generation of anointed children and youth that know about purpose and destiny. The thing about Jeremiah was, it's amazing that Je when Jeremiah was told by God, Jeremiah says, Hey, Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were inside your mother's womb, I had a plan and a purpose and a destiny for your life. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. What was Jeremiah's reaction? Wow, God, whoa, that is totally awesome. I'm ready. Jeremiah didn't say that. What Jeremiah said was this, just a minute, God. I can't speak, for I am just a teenager. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am a teenager. In other words, don't you use that as an excuse. For you shall go to all whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. God says, I don't care how young you are. I don't care you're just some goofy teenager. I put destiny and purpose on your life. You shall go to all whom I send you. I want to tell you folks this, this afternoon that prophets don't have to have a beard to be a prophet. You don't have to be an old man with a white beard living up on a mountain and coming down every 50 years to prophesy to the nations to qualify as a prophet. God is looking for prophets 
in our nation, among the youth, among the children, among the teenagers. I remember many years ago, I was speaking in a church and I heard about this little boy called Andrew. When Andrew was very small, this is the story, he was a mother was a Baptist lady, and when Andrew was very small, one time he was, he was very, he was actually had a lot of physical problems wrong with him, he was a very sick child, and one night he was taken up into heaven, he said, and he met Jesus, he met the angel Gabriel, and he went, met Moses, and when he came down from that experience, he was healed. Just a few weeks later, his mother comes into his bedroom one night and sparks were flying all over the bedroom. She runs in, she screams out, Andrew, Andrew, what's going on? He says, it's all right, mother. It's just the angels and the demons fighting. A little while later, he, she goes to minister to this lady who had a lot of problems. And she takes Andrew with her. He's only like a little preschool kid. And while she's ministering to this lady, Andrew disappears into another room, and suddenly she hears this beautiful music playing on the piano. She rushes in, and he's, he's sitting on the piano playing in the spirit. Didn't even know he could play. She said, Andrew, what are you doing? He says, Mama, I'm just playing the demons away. But every time I stop playing, that the demons come back because that lady likes the demons, and she doesn't want to get free from them. She took him eventually to her pastor and said, you know, I don't understand what's going on with my child. You know, and the pastor, after hearing some of the things, said, well, the boy's probably demon-possessed. So she left that church and went to a big charismatic church, huge charismatic church. And all they did, because this was a few years ago now, all they did was make notes. Well, what do you do with a, with a, with a kid like that? When I met Andrew, he was six. I remember he came to my meeting. I could see the anointing of God was all over him. And he came up and I prayed for him. I said, Andrew, what are you? He said, I'm a prophet. I said, Andrew, where are you going to preach? He said, China. Well, what do you do with a six-year-old prophet? <laughs> what does the church do with a six-year-old prophet? Oh, that's cute. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that nice? I want to tell you. Yeah, give him an office. I'm telling you, you're, we're, we're going to see more of this. See, we're, I want to prepare you that we're going to start bringing forth children of destiny and children of purpose that's going to blow the minds of the religious mindset. Hello. Just this year, I was in a meeting and, and we have, you know, when I have, I go to churches and, and do special weekends with a seminar and Sunday nights we have what we call a miracle service. And I have these children come up, you know, if they've been touched by the Lord during the week or during the meetings, they, they come up and have the children pray for not just themselves but for the big people. You know, we, I say, if you've got a need, whether it's spiritual, physical, financial, whatever it is, we're going to have the children come out and pray for you. It's called the laying on of sticky fingers. And... Uh, people get touched and I was it was just a few months ago I was in this church and a little girl uh, she got up on the platform with the other kids and started praying for people and this little girl she couldn't have been more than five years of age she must have been a, no more than five maybe four or five she was and uh, there was some people standing there and she went up to this woman the woman standing there and, and the little girl went up to her and she laid hands she was going and she says i come against the satanic i want to know i'm trying to remember the words she actually says she says i'm coming against the uh, satan i come against satan in the name of jesus and i break off all influence and oppression off of you in jesus name she says i Bind up the spirit and I command you to be free right now. I set you free in Jesus' name. And the woman looked over and then she put her nose, her finger right under the woman's nose. She says, now go and walk in your freedom. And then she went off and prayed for somebody else. I mean, she couldn't have been more than five years of age. <laughs> in that same meeting, at the end of the meeting, I walked down the aisle and a little girl came out. She was three. Because I asked how old she was. She says, I watch Joyce Myers on television every day. 
And she said, when she finishes preaching, I say, praise God, hallelujah. She says, I'm going to be a preacher when I grow up. I said, I think you already are. I said, would you like to come and travel me, be my assistant? She said, yes. See, a lot of these kids are just, I, I mean, they're just, they're ready. They're ready. They're just ready. The only limitation that children have is what we put upon them. So obviously, in our days, folks, we don't want to just raise our children to be nice and good and religious and follow the rules and regulations. We want to give our children a chance to fulfill their divine destiny in God. And the wonderful thing about God is they, God is not like a man. He doesn't say, I can use anybody, but I can't use children. See, we say to children, this is what we've done with children, and Van knows this. We've said, we go up to a little kid and say, hello, sweetheart. Jesus loves you. God loves all the little children. Oh, the children of the world. Now sit in church and be good. And don't be mean. And don't fight with your brothers and sisters and obey mummy and daddy. And one day, when you're older and when you're bigger, God will use you. But not now, not right now. You've got to grow up and go to cemetery. I mean, seminary first. And then maybe God will use you. But not right now. And so, what does that do for the kid? The kids go, wow, that's exciting. And the kid goes, oh. Because we're telling them that they can't do anything now. They have to wait. But you see, God put destiny in them. See, when Moses was born, his parents could have made the same mistake as many Christians. They could have sacrificed him to Pharaoh. Ooh! Hello? Hello? You remember what happened? All the Hebrew children were being drowned in the river. They could have sacrificed him to Pharaoh. And there are people today who are sacrificing their children to Pharaoh. Because they don't want to, they want to go with the flow. They don't want to, you know, they don't want to, they, they compromise. Oh, it's all right for my child to do this and do that. This is okay, this is okay. They said, no, there's no way we are going to sacrifice our children. So they hid him for three months because he was a beautiful child. They saw something in Moses. They saw that, that, that something. They didn't see very much. They didn't see what God saw. They saw he was a fine child, a beautiful child. So they said they were not going to sacrifice him. So they hid him for three months because they were not afraid of the king's command. Now, they saw something in Moses which was a touch of God's beauty upon him. But what did God see? I tell you what God saw in Moses. He saw Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Right there inside that infant. So what do we see in the nursery? Do we see smelly babies with smelly diapers and feeding bottles? Do we see anybody will do to help in the nursery? Or do we see destiny? Do we see purpose? Do we see what God has with our infants in the nursery? If you're called to the ministry of the nursery, is it one of the worst ministries? Is it something, oh, anybody will do, we'll need people in the nursery. Quick, we need some helpers in the nursery. Anybody will do. I want to tell you, we need anointed people in our nurseries today. Why? Because when you work with those infants, you're not called just to change diapers and feeding bottles. You're called to be a custodian of destiny. What an awesome call. What an awesome call. Am I nearly through? Five minutes, is it? I'm almost through anyway. So please, don't have non-Christians working in your church nursery. Don't have teenagers working in your nursery if, if they only want to be there because they don't want to be in the services. Hello. Don't have women working in your nursery that talk about the problems of the church and the problems of the, of the elders and all this. 
You say, and all that junk is going into the ears of those children. You say, but those children don't understand the words that are going being said. No, but all those negative things are going into their spirit, you see. How do you minister to children in a nursery? Well, obviously, as I said, you can't go and tell them they're all going to hell if they don't confess their sins and accept Jesus. But you can minister to their spirits. How? Oh, you read the word of God over them. You sing the songs of Zion over them. You pray over them. You say, but they don't understand. Ah, but their spirits will. Their spirits will respond. Their spirits will respond. And you will find that a whole nursery will change. Where there was pandemonium and screaming kids and dis this order, suddenly divine order will come and the presence of God will come, the peace of God will come and suddenly it will just be an awesome place to be. Trust me, I've seen it happen. It works. The Holy Spirit can bring infants into divine order quicker than anybody else. Awesome. That's why... When I, you know, when I started doing these seminars many years ago, people said to me, this, you're crazy. You are absolutely crazy. You cannot do a five-hour seminar and have infants and children and teenagers and nursery workers and Sunday school teachers and the whole thing. I mean, no, no, no. You've got to have a special place for the little ones and a special place for the children, a special place for the teens and a special place for the adults. I'm so glad what Richard Crisco said this morning about that's not the way now. But do you know what keeps them like that all day? It's the Spirit of God. See, it's what you believe for. It's what you believe for. Children don't have a short attention span. Like we've been told by the psychiatrist, it's a load of baloney. They don't. What gets their attention gets them. They come into the presence of God. I've seen children, I've seen, and I'm sure Van is too. Little toddlers in the presence of God for hours. Out in the Spirit for hours. Fixed, frozen in the Spirit for hours. Touched by the Lord. It's wonderful to see children switched on when the Spirit of God and the truth of God is just embracing them. They're ready. They're ready. Are you ready? Are the parents ready? Our children are ready. When I do my next, I think it's tomorrow, I do my other thing that will be about uh, the responsibility of parents, and we'll get into that, how we can prepare the parents to be ready for these great things that God is going to do with the children. Amen. Um, some of the things I'm kind of sharing with you are out of that training seminar, the album that I mentioned this morning. I just want to mention a couple of things here. Uh, Children of Flame is a one, if, you'd, if you've never read this book, this is, I think this is the first book that uh, Van ever...